Butler, the Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, effectively known as CJCC's Spring Public Meeting. Our theme this evening is a fresh start, how correctional facilities prepare the district's incarcerated persons for successful reintegration. I want to thank all of you for not only braving the wind, or actually being blown in here this evening, um, but also spending time with us this evening on what I believe is really critical, a critical area of focus for us um, in the District of Columbia, and more specifically important for us as a criminal justice community. Uh, we have a full agenda, and it's going to be traditionally with our public meetings, we really want to make sure we have the opportunity to have a dialogue, information sharing, um, but also um, an opportunity for, for our community to really hear and understand um, the lay of the land, if you will, here in the District of Columbia. I want to start off with just acknowledging uh, the number of CJCC members that are here. Um, so if you could all stand, please, the CJCC members to be acknowledged. We are also blessed to have um, Congresswoman Jordan, who will be bringing us a welcome of our greetings this evening. I want to note that we will be um, taping this evening's uh, meeting because it's important for us to be able to communicate. There's going to be a lot of rich information that will be shared, so we want to make sure that we have the opportunity for our community to also hear, for those who may not be able to join us this evening, to also um, be a part of tonight, this evening's experience. Um, we will also have a presentation um, made by uh, some folks and our friends at DYRS. So I want to acknowledge Director Lacey, Deputy Director Harley Harper, and thank you and your entire team. I see a number of you here for um, just making sure that we have the benefit of a first-hand experience and first-hand um, um, opportunity to, to experience the, what programming really is about and what it means and what it can do for us um, and for our citizens here in the District of Columbia. Without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, Kevin Donahue, uh, one of CJCC's co-chairs who will bring greetings, who will be followed by uh, the Honorable Eleanor Holmes North. Deputy Mayor. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, uh, there's very few issues that are more important, and I think there's more genuine energy across the whole city around uh, than improving what we do to make sure people coming back from incarceration have a fair shot. Really, it's about maximizing their human potential. Um, uh, April is Second Chance Month. It's an opportunity to be able to drink, draw attention um, to issues that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, when I think about second chances, um, I think not just of the agencies under me, but really the entire government and the entire community. And I think the issues that we'll hear tonight will cover housing, employment, mental health, access to health care, um, as well as reforms in the criminal justice community. Um, I look forward to listening and learning and doing my obligation to take what I learn and improve how we carry out services to these residents. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very short because I want to then welcome Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, to do opening remarks here. Uh, thank you so much for coming here this evening. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your work. And I especially want to thank the uh, Director Butler and the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for this very important annual meeting. I, I need to apologize uh, right now because uh, there are a number of official events where I'm due, and <laughs> this is an election year, so there are a number of campaign events where I am due. I'm your only elected official that has to run every two years. Boy. Uh, that means <laughs> as soon as I get into an issue, I have to keep thinking about uh, the next year's issue, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about um, our criminal justice system, especially about the Bureau of Prisons, and I'm pleased that the Bureau of Prisons representatives are here because of our unique relationship uh, with that agency. Um, 
So I'm not going to give you the ultimate in the math. I'm going to give you something of a report. It's going to be brief. But, the, but it's a lot about my meetings and work with the new director of the Bureau of Prisons, Mark Inch, about what I've already met with him and corresponded with him about, relating specifically to the District of Columbia. Uh, and I think it would be, uh, this is a good place, particularly since some of it has very recently come back to me from Director Inch, uh, to share it with you. For reasons that are perfectly clear to everybody in this room, Reentry is a top priority of mine. Uh, it would be if our young, young people were still in Norton, but they are far away, which uh, at a federal facility, which means we have to think differently about incarceration in the District of Columbia than they do in Maryland or Virginia or any, any state. So I have to work closely with a whole set of agencies that the, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council works with. Because our criminal justice system has never been in one place. So I've been working, yes, with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, with the sponsor of this organization, CJCC, with SOSA, critical to us if reentry is to work, and with uh, local and federal law enforcement all of whom relate to reentry of our citizens to the District of Columbia. Um, the new director, Mark Inch, is uh, different from other uh, appointees. Uh, he is a career official and not a political appointee. And I've been impressed with him uh, as I meet with him. That doesn't mean he is in subject. After all, this is a federal aid. Bureau of Prisons is a federal agency isn't subject to the administrative directives, but I have seen uh, every inclination all to understand that we are different and to work closely with us. Um, I met with him almost immediately after he took office when he came to my, off my office of my invitation. Um, let me tell you some of the issues I've been working with BOP on how they have responded and that I raised uh, with Director Inch. Um, let me begin with uh, making it easier for families to visit with their loved ones and returning citizens to make that transition to society because I believe returning citizens to make a transition to society very much easier. If they've had contact, you can see the, the issues that raises for us. Because there is a rule that says that inmates, not just DC, have to be within 500 miles. That doesn't help us in a lot. <laughs> and, 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 but that is the rule. And what I, I try to do is to press the Bureau of Prisons as far as I can to understand that within the rules there are very special ways in which they've got to accommodate DC residents and those located in his vicinity. Uh, for example, uh, some years ago I got an agreement um, with, with uh, the Bureau of Prisons and with our own uh, Department of Corrections that juveniles People who correct, corrected, yeah, youngsters corrected, uh, who have to be sent because they've been tried as adults, that while they are juveniles, they would be kept in the District of Columbia. That was very important, it seemed to us. If we're talking about keeping people close to their families, even more so uh, than juveniles, we had that agreement. I had it in writing. Um, so until they reached 18, uh, they were to remain in the district. At the time, I pressed this especially hard since the only juvenile facility was somewhere over in the southern United States, in Montana, somewhere over those places that you would never get to see a youngster before he was then sent to the adult uh, facilities. But look what has happened since. Um, juveniles are no longer held. Uh, at the Department of Corrections. 
In fact, I learned that they were moved at random times uh, to various facilities. Now, this is not as bad as it, it seemed because there are juvenile facilities in other places as there were not before. But we were not notified about that, that there were new juvenile facilities open and, and that that's why they were going to be moved. They just stopped keeping our folks uh, in D.C. Um, I'm very concerned about, about um, particularly juveniles having no access to attorneys as they move. their are currently, this is what BOP has told me, six D.C. youth located in juvenile facilities. There is one house here in D.C. Now, I, I have asked back and written back to say, how come one is housed here in D.C.? but three are in Texas, two are in South Dakota. This is exactly what we did more. So I would like to return uh, the, the situation back to where we left it, if for no other reason that these are juveniles that putting them in a Bureau of Prison facility is different from putting an adult in a Bureau of uh, Prison facility. The least they can do to keep us as close to them loved ones as possible. Now, they have cited a statute, I have my own lawyers looking at it, that uh, 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 is of this year, that they say, and I asked for the criminal, uh, the, the CJCC's help on this, they say, now again, we are checking in this, we just got this re reply, that the DC Council has passed a law that makes it impossible for them to hold juveniles at the, the uh, facility here in D.C. I think we had them in D.C. jail. I can't understand that. They didn't cite what, what the law was, so they've got us running around talking to the district. I asked uh, CDC to the Ms. Butler to help us on that. Now, they did tell us that they have awarded a contract, so clearly they're, they're redoing how they treat juveniles generally. They have awarded a contract for a facility in Morgantown, <coughs> Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know if that is for all youth in the United States, if that is for youth on the East Coast, but obviously they're trying to, perhaps other jurisdictions have also said they don't want their youth as far away as the Bureau of Prisons who would otherwise keep them. <coughs> but this is what has been written to us most recently. I had asked that uh, the BOP uh, place inmates at our own department of our own correctional, correctional facility. It's called the uh, DC Correctional Treatment Facility. I said, at 90 days, can they come back? He said, I'm trying to get, make reentry easier by coming in steps. You know, even before you get to the halfway house. Uh, they responded, uh, ironically, and again you will see why I have to make further inquiry, that the, the uh, Congressional Tre Treatment Center here is no longer used for long-term placements. I'm not talking about long-term placements. They have many days to go. And maybe they treat them as long-term because they have been long-term in BOP, but they've got to explain that to me. And the reason that they give, ironically, is because our own Department of Correctional Treatment does not have many of the re-entry programs that inmates most need. Well, if they haven't had them up until, or they've had them up until, let's say, 90 days, it seems to me being closer to home, rather than God knows where, would be the best treatment they could get particularly since we've been sending them right, bringing them right back to the District of Columbia. But that's what they cite. They say, look, the, the, uh, the correctional treatment facility does not have, and believe me, BOP has the best uh, programs in the United States. I don't know if that's saying a lot, but it's the federal facility is far better than state facilities. So they cite substance abuse and uh, training and workplace programs. Um, uh, and they cite that as a reason for not sending our folks back 90 days. I'm going to have to be meeting with DC and see uh, what they think of that. 
uh, since, as far as I can see, we get them cold, uh, and, or at least the halfway house does. So I'm not sure exactly how to read that. Would we be breaking into programs that they are in the process of, like the substance treatment programs? We certainly wouldn't want them to stop that. But you see, I have a lot of work to do given the replies that they've given us. Um, uh, I, I have um, uh, a big uh, problem with the way uh, our folks in halfway houses are treated with respect to subsistence food. How, now, this is, I've had to put in a bill for this because it applies to all Bureau of Prisons uh, inmates. And so I've introduced the bill, actually tried to get it put on an appropriation bill, but BOB requires that he pay 25% of what you earn. Earn? Most of these uh, returning citizens don't have jobs. If they're lucky enough to get a job, I say this is a deterrent for getting a job, then you must pay 25% uh, for your, your subsistence at the halfway house. Why wouldn't you pay it for your children? Uh, um, the, and, 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 and I was able to get a change uh, from a couple years ago, up until a couple years ago, if you were home confined. You still had to pay this 25%. Uh, we shouldn't be imposing additional burdens on returning citizens. They're going to be quite a lot of burdens as it is. And the notion of paying subsistence fee means that I don't see how anybody would go looking for a job at, at entry level, only to turn it over to the, the government. But when the when the uh, Obama administration was in power, there we got we worked with them and got a Department of Justice memorandum that recommended a plan for very limited use. And here I'm quoting, so you know that we were on our way of what they called counterproductive subsistence fees imposed on indigent residents. Indigent residents is most of them, virtually all of them. And then it went on to say, the bureaus, this is the Department of Justice speaking, the bureau's process for collecting these subsistence fees is uh, costly and administratively burdensome for both halfway houses and the bureau, and these fees make it difficult for residents who typically earn minimum wage to meet, meet their other financial obligations, including restitution, fines, and child support. So we were on our way. We've been set back uh, on this with the change in administration. I'm not going to stop on this one. It seems clear as, as the nose on your face that the government, it probably costs the government more money to put, uh, if it collects anything. Uh, then, then to let uh, or encourage residents to take whatever work they can find. Uh, during the hurricanes, uh, we were very concerned that they, they typically, many of our prisons are located in hurricane territory. We had DC residents in Texas and Florida. Uh, I wrote and spoke with uh, BOP officials and was assured and became assured that uh, our residents were safe. My concern was the um, failure to promptly, since we couldn't call out, to promptly let the families know that these residents were not in harm's way. I uh, asked for an increase in video conferencing, for this is a good way, since they're so far away, to get uh, both attorneys and families uh, district residents have traveled hundreds of miles and very few are able to do that. And some have traveled only to be turned back because of a very strict uh, dress code. Uh, uh, Bureau of Prisons says, they give me the names, but in writing they say there are 15 um, places uh, where they have video conferencing. I'm seeking the names of those so that I can inform DC residents, uh, and they say if attorneys want to speak, and by the way, these are concerns that were given to me by attorneys and by families. If they want to speak, there's a, 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 a certain kind of a, um, 
system they're using, I understand that they might want, not want to use bureau, uh, sorry, video conferencing, but that system is in high demand because it's, it's not only used for attorney-client uh, conversations, but is, is used uh, uh, for telemedicine, staff training, and other meetings. This is very, uh, this is very worrisome to me. If you can't be in touch with a lawyer, I believe there's a Sixth Amendment constitutional right uh, raised, uh, and if your facility is located so far away that you need or the attorney needs access, and there is simply no way unless you're in one of, and you can't go video conferencing because you can't do that with attorney-client relationships, uh, they gotta come back and tell me uh, because there has been, these complaints come from residents. What they're gonna do to at least make it possible for attorneys to be in touch with their own clients. This could be very, very serious matters. The dress code, this is outrageous. Um, there got to be some way, and I'm asking so that I can inform residents what the dress code is. This is the first time I've ever heard of the dress code. Can't wear clothing similar to the inmates' uniforms. What, what color are the inmates' uniforms? How do you know before you go out there, unless this is more widely understood? Um, no provocative or revealing clothing. That's a security matter. We need to let residents know about these kinds of things. They need to broadly make sure that our own residents in these facilities have information they can send to their own relatives and, and loved ones. I've asked for a quote point person for the District of Columbia at the BOP. After I heard these complaints from our folks, I said, please somebody to talk to. They have given me, they have said we can talk to the regional office associated with the, with the facility or even the executive assistant. I, 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 I'm investigating whether or not that is ample. Uh, it does not sound to me as though it is, uh, perhaps so. I won't cast judgment until I try it since I just received this. I think I received <laughs> these answers, because I, I sent this letter to Director Inch, who I emphasize has been very cooperative with us, but I just got this answer. I think somebody told Director Inch that you were having this meeting today. So I appreciate that I had at least something to say about what they said. Uh, look, these are, there's a, there's a lot of, um, of my, the, the, the time of my staff and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, my own work is spent on BOP because so many of our residents are located in these facilities. Um, um, my, there's one member of staff who, who almost full time, uh, Ken, Kenyon McDuffie, I wish you put that name down, who is very knowledgeable and is, uh, and is in touch with uh, uh, Damien McDuffie, thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kenyon is the council member. <laughs> Damien McDuffie, uh, who is extremely knowledgeable and extremely good at keeping in touch. Uh, I, I do regret that he was not able to be here. He was going on the other side of the campus. Uh, but I, I'm going to be seeking a meeting with Director Butler afterwards for follow-up based on what uh, comes forward at this very important event today. And thank you all for being here. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to Congresswoman Norton for her comments and her report um, and for the questions that she raised and the issues that she put forth. Um, to me, it's, it's in keeping with the spirit of a public meeting. We want um, our voices to be heard, and I'm grateful that we have leaders in the district's criminal justice uh, system that can begin to start or continue the conversation that she started with us. Um, so in true CJCC fashion, we do want this to be interactive. There, we'll have a panel later. There will be time for Q&A. Um, but we want to learn a little bit about you, and we also want to share some information uh, about the criminal justice system and, and some information about um, incarcerated persons in the district. So each of you, hopefully most of you, received a clicker or a key, keypad, whatever you want to call it. 
Um, so I'm sure a lot of you uh, know how to use this already. We're going to display questions. There will be answer choices. Click the number that's associated with um, your answer choice. And if you choose it, it's whatever your last choice was. So you can, if you hit the wrong number, you can hit the correct one. It'll capture your correct answer. Yes, ma'am. Um, we will try to get you a clicker. Thank you. Does anyone else need one while we're at it? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we will start with question number one. Where do you live? In the district, in which ward, or do you live in Maryland, Virginia? Showing from Virginia today, a number of us uh, live in Virginia. Um, I believe it's still most of us live in the district, and some from Maryland. Is it Maryland and not Virginia? Oh, I see. Sorry, Virginia is zero percent. Yep. And if you could describe what is your primary involvement with the criminal with the justice system. Stop there. Let's see. Okay, so we have a, a, a wide range of representation, a number from correction agencies, a number from uh, supervision and pro probation agencies as well. Thanks. Next question. So in general, this is where we're trying to share some information, engage kind of your understanding of the criminal justice system. So in general, we know there are caveats and exceptions. What is the key difference between a jail and a prison? Is one run by the government versus private? One run by the state versus federal? Length of sentence? Or there is no difference? seems to be the most popular choice and it is also the correct answer in general the difference between jail and prison really is the length of sentence um, and oftentimes most people in jail are there prior to a disposition for their case their pretrial predisposition and even if you're sentenced to a term in jail it's typically going to be less than a year Next question. so again in general an adult who is convicted of a felony in D.C. is and sentenced to incarceration will ultimately be placed in a facility operated by which of the following? DYRS, BOP, or DOC? Predominant answer was BOP, which is also the correct answer. Next question. So an adult who is detained prior to the completion of his or her trial will be placed in a facility operated by same answer choices, DYRS, BOP, or DOC. And I may have just given the answer to that question. All right, let's, uh, almost there, yeah. 
And that is also the correct answer, DOC. Again, um, the DC jail houses primarily uh, pre-trial detainees. Next. So a juvenile in DC who is adjudicated delinquent and is committed would be placed in a facility operated by DYRS, FBOP, or DOC. This one may be obvious. Okay. DYRS, and that is the correct answer. I think we have a few more questions. So true or false, adults and juveniles can be co-mingled in the same correctional facility as long as they have separate sleeping arrangements. True or false? All right. Um, so the correct answer is actually false. Um, there are federal requirements in the district that adheres to those that there should be sight and sound separation for adults and juveniles if they happen to be in the same facility. And then uh, we're coming towards the end of the questions. How many people were released from DOC during 2017? Probably the best way to phrase it is how many releases were there. Um, because these particular figures maybe uh, include some double counting. Okay. Right, and I believe that is the correct answer. Number one, there were um, almost 12,000 releases from DOC last year. And similarly, how many um, persons sentenced in DC were released from BOP last year? And the correct answer is about 2,000, a little over 2,000 releases from BOP. And similarly, how many youth were released from DYRS in 2017? From secured facilities, I should say, which is released from BOP. answer is, all right, if you um, got that correct. And I think this is our last question. Just, um, just kind of your perspective as we set the stage for um, the rest of the evening. To what extent do you agree with the following? Correctional facilities have sufficient programs in place to help support successful reintegration upon release. Okay, so we got a lot of answers, disagree or strongly disagree. Uh, so hopefully we will hear about the agency's efforts today to try to help improve in this area to help ensure successful reintegration. Um, so thank you very much for participating in that survey. CJCC staff will be coming around to collect your keypads.